How do geometry nodes actually work within Blender? It feels like most tutorials out there show you what to do, but not like why you would do that or how you do that. With something like geometry nodes, it's kind of overwhelming. How do you know which node to use when? Like what's the thought process that you need to have as you're going about building something in geometry nodes? So today we're gonna to do exactly that. This is going to be very much a learn by doing scenario. So what I can promise you is I'm not just gonna be like, click here, add this node, do this, do that. Okay, we're done. And here is the owl. We're going to talk about a certain philosophy that I've began to use with geometry nodes that has completely changed the way I use them at all. Maybe I still don't know every single little thing, but at least I have that foundation where I can put things together and know how to go about that. So I'm excited to share that philosophy with you. Specifically today, what we're going to do is we're going to build a stitch pattern. So if you can imagine if you're modeling, you might need a stitch. If you're stitching fabric together or you're, you're trying to put a stitch on a leather patch that's getting stitched to another surface like a jacket or um, a hat. And this will just be a really fun way for us to play around with geometry nodes and really learn how they work under the hood. So what can you expect in this video? We're gonna quickly talk about how you would build something without using geometry nodes to get that foundation first, and then jump right into geometry nodes and learn how we do the exact same thing there. Once we're in there, we're gonna specifically talk about how to generate curves and meshes, how to convert that curve into a mesh, what are the different options available there? How do we scale and rotate things? How would we maybe make a mesh follow a curve in geometry nodes? There's a bunch of different data types in there. What do those mean? Attributes, fields. Every geometry node seems to be a group with an input and output. How do those actually work? And is it actually possible to reuse those? Also, what about like extruding things and shade smooth and all that jazz? Like, is that possible to do within geometry nodes? So these are some of the things we'll chat about, but overall the main goal here is a mindset, right? At the end of the day, we're not gonna go through every single possible geometry node one by one. In fact, that would be, in my opinion, extremely boring. So again, today we're going to be learning by doing and really just focusing on developing a new perspective around geometry nodes that suddenly makes everything so much easier to use. By the way, I'll tell you right now, we will be going down some rabbit holes, so I've given you fair warning. All right, let's get started. So first of all, um, you know, my resolution is probably a little bit high right now, so I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. Let me know if that helps. And yeah, let's get started. So we're gonna get rid of our default cube. We're gonna go from a bird's eye view here. And what, how might you go about creating a stitch to stitch something onto something else, right? We got, you can stitch fabric onto other things, seams within a piece of fabric, or like we talked about a leather patch onto a shirt or a hat or whatever. So the first thing that comes to my mind is to use a curve. So if you're familiar with Blender, we got curves. We have a couple different types. So what if we took like a Bezier curve, which looks like this, and we went and edited that guy, and perhaps we, you know, do something kind of like this. You know, we want to create that arch for a stitch. Right now we're just going to create a single stitch. Maybe this needs to come a little bit more vertical, right? The, the stitch isn't going to be perfectly spherical. It's going to kind of pierce into the sides. So we might do something like that. Great. We got our curve. It's at the wrong angle. So what you might do is you might go uh, rotate. So R on the X axis and we rotate it up by 90. So now that has moved it up so that it's vertical. And then you might just come down here into your properties. Um, we know that curves have a geometry and we could set a uh, depth on that guy to extrude them. And now you can imagine, you can start to imagine this could be a potential stitch, right? So say we were stitching something on, we need like a curve or a, a, in this case, let's make a circle. Uh, so we create like a, a circle, scale that guy up, maybe scale this guy down a bit, and then we can apply a couple modifiers, right? So a uh, typical way you might do this is Okay, we got our Bezier curve. Let's go ahead and make this an array modifier, which will just basically duplicate it. So right now there's two, we can just keep that rolling. Um, perhaps we want a bit of an offset between them because they're not right up against each other all the time. Um, and then we can add another modifier called a curve modifier that would basically attach this to whatever curve you like. Boom, and there we go. We can kind of play around with those at the length. It's a little bit tedious at this point, but you know, 32 looks all right. Um, this last point probably isn't perfect, but it looks pretty good. So we got lucky. Yeah, that's a very basic, simple way you might do something like a stitch, right? And then of course we'd have something like a uh, cylinder. Let's increase the vertices on this guy, 100. 
Um, we'll pull him right out to be just bigger. And then this guy is way too tall. So we're going to scale him down, scale Z and something like that could be like our little circle leather patch. And we'll bring him down just a little bit. So they kind of overlap. And then you got kind of like the stitch pattern, right? I'm going to quickly add a leather texture here. And I'm just cheating a little bit because I have a library I've just set up, which you can do for free. So let me know if you want a tutorial on that one. I'm going to shade smooth this guy just so that it is even. And if you're familiar with shade smooth, you usually have problems with the normal. So we can say auto smooth at 30 degrees and we look pretty good. So you can imagine this is like a some sort of patch that we're going to stitch onto maybe like another surface behind it. Okay, so there is our patch and then let's just quickly add a material on this guy we'll call this the stitch and let's just make it some similar color a little bit darker i've done this already once before so i'm going to turn the roughness up all the way and the specular down kind of make it give it that uh that uh, threaded material um we could go all out if we wanted to we could make this actually look like a thread with a specific texture i'm not going to go that far right now all right so that's without a geometry node so how would we do the equivalent with geometry nodes? So what, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to explain this as I go, so bear with me. I'm just going to start with my um, my curve. So let's rename this just to uh, circle curve. This guy is going to be called um, old school stitch. And then we're actually going to turn this curve itself into the geometry node here. And I'll explain why in just a little bit. So to do geometry nodes, we have this nice workspace at the top called geometry nodes. We can go ahead and click on that. And with our circle curve selected, we can click new. And that basically adds the geometry nodes modifier for us. What we could have done instead is just gone to the modifiers tab, add modifier at geometry nodes, and that would have basically done the same thing. So with our geometry nodes, super high level, you basically have a input and output. What does that mean? Input is the input geometry given to this. So in this case, since I added the modifier to my circle curve, that is my input, the circle curve. And then the output is whatever you want to output. And since we just have a simple line going between the two, what you get put in is what you get out. But of course, that's not very useful on its own. And here is where I want to start talking about the real power of geometry nodes. And this philosophy that I'm about to go through is the philosophy that I've started to use when I'm using geometry nodes. And really, it has motivated me to use geometry nodes a lot more uh, because of this. And here it is. Basically, think of geometry nodes as pre-recorded actions. What does that mean? OK, so I'm in my object view here, right? Control A. Uh, or sorry, shift A, we're going to go ahead and do something, right? Okay, I'm going to add a cube to the scene. That's an action. I just did something. I added a cube. Okay, what else might I do with this cube? Okay, I might uh, scale it or maybe scale Z this direction. I might rotate it. Okay, I've done a couple things now. I've added the cube. I've scaled it. I've rotated it. What else can I do? I can add modifiers to it. I could um, mess with a bunch of the properties. You get the point. We can do all these different actions. What if there was some way to, in a sense, record those actions so that instead of manually doing them over and over again, we can just define them in a single spot. Like if we could just create like a, a list of actions. Okay, number one, let's add the cube. Number two, let's rotate the cube. Number three, let's uh, scale it. Okay, I did it in the other order, but you get the point. What if there's some way to write that down, pass that into Blender and say, go run this. And then what if there's a way to reuse those over and over again, right? And before geometry nodes, you'd be thinking, yeah, okay, this would be called scripting, right? Uh, if you've ever dabbled in this at all, which I'll admit I have not very much at this point, uh, Blender uses Python as a scripting language. So you can go ahead and um, use Python to literally write code in the Python programming language to manipulate your objects within Blender. And you can create functions. And if you're coming from a programming background, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You create functions, you reuse code over and over again, you have inputs, outputs. This is very much a programmer kind of thing that you might do to accomplish what I'm talking about. And this is literally how add-ons are created, right? You install some add-on from, from some developer. How do they make that add-on? They create a script with Python code that manipulates your objects or adds your objects. They have a you know, a line in their code that says, uh, add a mesh to the scene and then scale it and rotate it and do whatever they need to do in order to build their add-on, right? Back to geometry nodes. Well, it turns out geometry nodes basically allow every single one of us, whether we're a programmer or not, to become programmers. 
Geometry nodes at the end of the day is basically visual programming. By visual, I mean you're dragging and dropping nodes on a scene, but this is pretty much exactly what a programmer would be doing, but instead of running code, you're doing it visually. And if you come from a programming background, this is possibly the best thing you've ever heard because this is the way your brain thinks. And now that you know that you can do that within these geometry nodes, that's a game changer. And if, if you're a programmer, you might be thinking, well, I'll just stick to the scripting. Uh, and that's perfectly fine, good for you. Um, but I'll explain a little bit as we go why geometry nodes perhaps can make your life a lot easier um, at least at the beginning. So first things first, let's do exactly like I was demonstrating there. So first things we're gonna do is shift A, just like anywhere else to add stuff. And you're, you know, you're brought up with all this stuff, right? It's, it's overwhelming. But once you start to understand like the idea behind some of these, uh, it becomes a lot less overwhelming pretty quick. For example, we have this mesh. Okay, what is this? Okay, it looks like it's like operations on a mesh. mesh. Okay, I can extrude a mesh. It's kind of interesting, cool. But like, can I create a mesh? Uh, and that's where this mesh primitive comes in, right? Mesh. This is looks just like if you were to go control A mesh, um, mesh primitive. Okay, cool. What does that mean? Okay, so let's add a cube, for example. So instead of adding literally a cube to the scene, I've added this cube node, which represents um, the formation of the cube, right? So now I can just drag this mesh into my output and boom, now we have an actual cube in our scene. But pay attention here, we're still selecting the circle curve, right? Because that's where we're applying this geometry node. Uh, we're just basically saying, I don't care what the original input was. The original input was this circle curve. I'm saying, uh, forget that. I'm just gonna completely disconnect that guy. And instead I'm gonna output this cube instead. So be it, cool. What if I want to scale this guy like I did? Well, uh, you can actually change the size right in here if you wanted to, um, but that's actually not quite equivalent this is changing the actual cube size, I believe, where um, what you might do instead is a um, transformation operation. Um, so if you're looking for like scale, for example, there's scale elements that provides a uniform scale or you can do a single axis. Um, so that works for scale. Let's see, is there, if you wanna do rotation, rotate. There's this rotate instances, but it's not quite what you think it is. Um, so instead what we can do is we can do what I did before transform which will allow you to do the translate rotation and scale so if I pop my mesh into that guy and then this guy into our output um, we can do like what you would do here um, in your transform panel right you're scaling not the underlying uh, element but the um, the object itself. So let's say I extrude the Z, everything else can come down a little bit. Uh, I might rotate it that way. Where, which direction did I rotate it? X. Uh, and now I've kind of gotten something sort of similar to what I had before. And that's amazing, right? Because now, you know, this was a very, very simple and contrived example, right? This is probably pretty useless. Um, but you can imagine like there's, as we go through here, there's gonna be a lot of possibilities we can do with this. And that can be extremely powerful. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. So let's, let's delete this cube, we don't need that. Um, we're gonna try to go back and create our stitch. So we're also gonna get rid of this cube because that guy is just in our way now. And we'll come back here. So first things first, we need to create a stitch like our old stitch, right? Uh, and to do that, we created that Bezier curve. So if I go Control A and search for Bezier segment, which is also under curve primitives, right? So just like mesh, we have this curve, which is like more like curve operations. Uh, and then this cur curve primitives where you actually would literally instantiate these curves. So um, let's do a Bezier segment. And this is so cool, right? Because instead of um, having to add the, the segment to your scene, uh, tapping into that into edit mode and then like manually modifying it, um, you can just do this once as a node and then this can be reused and repeated however you like. So it's gonna be a little bit more work probably to get it adjusted in the first place, right? We, we can't just tab into it and, and adjust the handles. As you can see, these handles are actually not the handles of this curve. These are still the handles of my original um, curve. And that's just because, again, geometry nodes are separate. This is, if I go back here, I'm just back in my same old viewport, same old blender again. If I go tab, I'm still talking about the circle curve, right? That's what I'm editing there. Uh, it's within this, these geometry nodes is where we need to do that. And so here is our Bezier curve like we had before. You see we have a couple options here. We have our start and end, which is talking about um, that point there, right? Start and we have our, let me actually just isolate this guy so it's easier to see. Isolate is slash on your keyboard. We are start handle, which is like 
somewhere talking about in there again we can't really visualize it but we can kind of we can kind of get it and then obviously if we understand the start handle there's got to be some sort of end handle so this isn't symmetrical we kind of want it to be symmetrical so just do the same thing let's create an end handle at well that one's 0.5 so let's go 0.5 and then the y there is 0.5 so let's do 0.5 okay perfect so now we have like kind of like this part of a circle in a way but just like we, what we did before it's not really a stitch doesn't really look like that right it's mo it comes more like up over and back down so maybe let's move our start handle back a bit maybe negative one that would make that go straight up see that's already one benefit of using these geometry nodes is um, if you do want to be extremely precise which I'm a very OCD person and so even outside of geometry nodes I find myself you know typing in numbers trying to make things sure things are like exact and this makes doing that really easy okay so we've made that the same uh, and you might be thinking about now hey this is kind of annoying because we always want this to be symmetrical right a stitch is always going to kind of be symmetrical from this uh, profile it's never going to like be lopsided on one side um, so is there any way we can actually force that in here turns out there is so if we go into our nodes there is a special node in here called a vector node which to be honest i don't even know where it is i just kind of searched it hoping that it would exist where is it oh it's an input okay vector um by the way um i create a shortcut for search which is uh control a on my keyboard uh, whoops uh that just makes my life a lot easier because i'm almost always searching for that for stuff right so if i did shift a a lot of people just go shift a click i think and i just find that one extra step that's kind of annoying so why not just control a and if you don't know how to do that, you just right click on here and go, it would say add shortcut for you if you don't have one yet. All right, so we got our vector and each of these is a vector, right? You can tell by the fact they have an X, Y, and Z. So let's just make this vector match our, let's say our end handles. So we got one, we got 0.5 and that's perfect. And you're thinking, okay, just could just pop this into both, but except for one problem, our start handle is actually negative where our end handle is positive. So if I pop this into both, dang, that, that obviously won't work because we need the start handle to have a negative X. And this is where it's super easy with nodes, right? Um, turns out there's a node called a math node. And this is actually the wrong kind because it is a scalar. Uh, we actually want a math, uh, vector math node, right? So there's a couple different types of math. Um, in this case, since we're working on a vector, which is, has an X, Y, and Z, we need to be doing a vector math operation. Um, so we will go ahead and do vector math. We're going to do a multiplication on our X. So let's First of all, make them all one. We're gonna pass that guy into there. So right now it's just multiplying them all by one and that basically does nothing. But now I can change the X to negative one. So I'll basically take each of these negative one, positive five, zero, because I'm not using Z. Um, and it basically does exactly like we want. So if I pass it in there, nothing changed, which is what we were hoping. Um, and now all I need to do is change a single spot over here. And you can see that we're moving symmetrically. Amazing. So that's pretty sweet. Um, as you can see, we got a bit of a problem. Remember before we did a rotation, we hit RX 90, right? So I'm not gonna do that on here because that's actually gonna literally rotate our circle curve. All the actions we need to do need to be within our geometry nodes. So how can I rotate this guy? Well, we just talked about that earlier. There's a good old transform node. So I just, which by the way, just pop these on the lines and it just auto adds them, which is super convenient. Um, so let's go ahead and rotate about the X 90 degrees. Boom, looks great. Um, and then we, what was the next thing we did? Well, we came in here to our stitch and we went to the geometry and we added some depth to the round bevel. How are we gonna do that? So, you know, what, what would you search for in this situation? And I'll admit there's lots of times I try to search for something and it's just, it just did not exist. I'm like, okay, this is annoying. Had to Google it, finally found it after not too long. Okay, that's all good. Other situations you get lucky. So like I'm thinking, how would I turn a curve into a mesh? Perhaps there's like a curve to mesh. Okay, awesome. So we'll just pop that in between. And now this is technically a mesh, but why does it not look any different? Well, unlike our convenient bevel function on our curves um, within blend, regular Blender, what you'll find in geometry nodes, by the way, quite often is there's usually an operation in here for kind of every single thing that you might do within Blender, right? Um, control A, add things, you know, as you as we've already found out, you can add curves, you can add meshes, um, you can do curve to mesh, um, which actually is more equivalent to going um, convert to mesh, right? If, if you've ever done that before, that will literally turn this curve into a real mesh within uh, Blender. And so the point I'm making here is basically there, there's almost a node for everything you might do, but 
uh, the Blender developers and the Blender team has basically almost made them even more module in some, some situations just to make them uh, work better within a node environment here. Um, so curve to mesh doesn't do anything. What we need to do is we add, need to add this profile curve. There's no convenient um, bevel rounding and whatever. That's okay. That actually just, that's actually a good thing because that gives us more flexibility and makes each of these a little bit more modular, right? So I need a cur profile curve. If you've ever done profiles before, that's going to be another curve. Let's make that a curve circle, right? That'd be equivalent to going control A curve circle like we actually did at the very beginning. Um, don't need that. So we just did that and we're going to pop that guy into our profile curve and whoa, way too big. So let's pull that guy down. I'm holding shift by the way, because normally this is like extremely sensitive. So if you hold shift, that brings down the sensitivity. Um, and now we kind of have like that stitch, right? Cool. And of course you can adjust the resolution if you wanted to change that. Um, let's fill those caps, right? You might've seen this option elsewhere in Blender. So that's the, the same thing. Uh, and cool, we have this mesh. So the next thing we did was we took that mesh and we added, um, well, it was actually still a curve in this situation, but we, we did that array modifier that we duplicated that, remember? Uh, and then we attach it to a curve. So how do we do something like that? Well, there may be a way to duplicate in um, geometry nodes, but there's actually a better way to do this in general around a curve. And let me show you how I would do that. So first of all, we have our group input. And if you recall, this geometry is literally our original circle curve, right? If I pop that back in, there's our circle. So what we need to do just like before is make this Bezier segment, basically duplicate it and then make it follow along this curve. How do we do that? Well, turns out, and I'll tell you, I did have to search for this one. Um, we have this curve operation called a curve two points, and this is extremely handy. Um, looks kind of freaky right now. Um, the reason why is because their points by default are just massive. Um, if I were to like, for example, scale, whoop, scale this out, you can see what's actually kind of going on here. Instead of scaling that out though, I'm going to do another operation. And so basically curve to points, we have these points and they're going out to the geometry. And what's a point? I guess it's just like literally whatever that thing is, that's a point. And it's, it can be considered a mesh because it happily connects to the geometry. Um, of course, we don't want these points. We want to replace them with something else. So is there some sort of way to like take these points and put a different object on it? And I'll just tell you what that is. It's called, uh, or it's called point, it's called instance on points. There we go. So we'll pop that on here and instantly everything just disappeared because we have no instances passed in. As you can see here, it's expecting some sort of instance. Conveniently, we have our stitch ready to go. So if we pass that stitch on there, uh, cool. But uh, perhaps the stitch is a little bit too big. So we can come back to our transform, scale all those guys down, maybe scale down our radius even more. And now you can see, okay, we're kind of getting closer to what we want, right? We have these stitches, they're going around our curve. One thing that stands out right away is they're not rotating along the curve, right? They're all kind of like facing the same direction, which is not what we want. And conveniently, this curve to points actually has a rotation output, which is basically the output of this rotation is gonna basically as you go around the curve, this rotation will change. And so that's extremely convenient for our situation here because we have uh, this rotation, which if you just change it in one spot, it changes them all, right? Um, uh, and this is where the power of nodes kind of comes in, right? You know, on its own, this is just being applied to everything, but you can have basically inputs that will vary across a surface. So in this case, we're having a rotation that as you go around the rotate uh, the curve, this rotation will change, which is literally perfect for us. As you can see now, they're all rotating the wrong way, but they're all at least rotating along the curve. Of course, to fix that, we'll just need to come back to our transform here and just uh, bring that back up to, I guess, what we do is 180 here. Again, we can be precise, we should be precise. Next we can, thing we can do is rotate our Ys and looks like that should be 90. And then perfect, now we are actually getting a kind of good looking stitch. Now, one thing we didn't talk about here is this curve to points has this parameter here called count which is really cool because you can just uh, increase this or decrease this to configure the number of instances it will create. And you can probably see what, now why this is a lot better than that array modifier, right? Because the array modifier, you kind of have to give it a specific amount. And uh, instead, 
it, it's always going to go along the curve and just space itself out accordingly. Um, but we can actually do one better in my opinion. Um, you know, this is subjective based on what you're trying to accomplish. But if we scale out our um, curve here, you can see the count doesn't change, right? That count was fixed. We still only have 12. They're just more spaced apart. And to me, if you're going to be using this geometry node, which is a stitch, probably you're going to want it to just like keep an even stitch distance between each one of them. And if I scale this out, I'd rather just add more instead. And turns out there is a actual perfect solution for that. And that is change this option from count to length. And what length is basically doing is, well, it's way too close right now. Um, what length is basically doing is setting a fixed distance between each segment, right? So here I have 0.37. Let's change this to like 0.5, um, right? You, we can, I can prove this if I pull our handy dandy measuring tape. Uh, you can click on that to do that, or I believe it's shift space M there. We'll do that too. So let's pretend the origin, actually the origin probably is in the center of each of these stitches. So if I measure, let's go from bird's eye view from here, center of here to the center of there, it is 2.5. So I am lying to your face right now. Uh, I think I know what's going on. We need to change our, yeah, we have a scale on our curve. So usually this this is why people always say you should apply your scale, right? <laughs> Lots of tutorials I see, oh, just apply your scale, let's move on, right? Why are we actually doing that? It's for situations like this, right? Because the underlying curve has a different scale than the object here. So it kind of throws off our expectations sometimes. Um, so if I apply the scale, what that's basically doing is go into this underlying um, curve and set the scale to whatever this is. And now this is considered one, right? So as you can see, that changed it quite a bit. We have uh, stitches all over. And now if I zoom in and do our good old measurement again, we can see we're, ba well, we're not basically, we are exactly 0.5 meters. So that confirmed what our expectation was with that parameter. And it makes sense, right? If I change this all the way down to zero, bro, they're overlapping like crazy. And that's just because, again, the center is in, this, in the middle, right? So they're just like duplicating right next to each other. Um, we need to bring this to at least the length of one segment. Um, but I'm going to say a little bit more because, I don't know, depending on the kind of stitch, there might be um, an even gap between them like that, right? Cool. Now, just to fully just demonstrate what I was trying to show there, um, if I go ahead and change, and by the way, I'm going into edit mode so that I'm changing the actual scale, right? If I didn't, if I did that in object mode, we have the same problem. I have to keep on applying it. So let's just go right in there. As I scale this, amazing, it's actually adding these um, stitches for me and basically keeping that consistent distance, which is what I believe most people will want with a stitch. Perfect, let's bring that down just to make our life a little bit easier. Okay, cool. So one thing I want to talk about next is this thing called attributes. And being completely honest, was really confused how attributes work in Blender for the longest time. So if I go into, whoops, um, by the way, I turned my screencast keys on here. Sorry, I don't know why that wasn't showing up before. It was only showing up in my layout workspace. Um, so that's back now. Uh, all right, so uh, attributes. If I go Shift A, and we come down to the inputs here. Uh, we have a bunch of different, what they're calling inputs here. And if we go below this separator, um, we have a bunch of what we call uh, attributes. And what do attributes do? Well, attributes work within the context of whatever you're connecting them to. Okay, that sounded kind of theoretical and vague. What does that really mean? So in this case, we have our instance on points, right? And something that you could change, for example, is your scale, right? Here, I'm, I'm uh, shifting the scale up and down. Um, and like we talked about before uh, with the rotation, um, it doesn't always have to be a fixed value. It could be actually a data set, uh, multiple values like this rotation actually changes as you go around each point. And if you pop that into the, the rotation input on this instance to points, it will actually have a different rotation for every single point that was passed to it, uh, which is really which is, So this is where attributes can be quite powerful. Um, so for example, if I go into my inputs and I grab index. What is index? Well, if you come from a programming background, this should be pretty obvious. Um, if you don't, uh, index is talking about which element within a list am I referring to? So for example, uh, in programming terms, we call these arrays or lists. And, and in this case, right, we have a list of uh, whatever we can count these one, two, three, four, uh, let's just say 20. Okay, it's gonna bother me now. One, two, three, four. I was off. Fourteen. Okay, so we got fourteen points 
and each of these is going to have an index. And when it comes to programming, uh, everything's zero based. What does zero based mean? It means instead of the first one being considered one, so pretend this was the very first um, point on the curve. Instead of going one, two, three, four, you start at zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. So by the time you go all the way around, it's actually going to be zero through 13 instead of one through 14. It's still 14 elements, it's just uh, what you call zero based. And why is that? This is the case for basically all programming because first of all, this is just how a computer works. And second of all, uh, the math actually tends to work a lot better with things being zero based. Uh, in this case for Blender, being zero based uh, is actually quite handy. So for example, if I were to pass this index into my, something like my scale, what would actually happen? Since index is actually gonna be changing for every single element, right? Um, and I probably got this wrong. Probably this one actually isn't the first one. It's probably, well, let's just see. So if I pass that in here, I think probably this one over here was the first one. And let me explain that. So what just happened there? Well, as index increases, right? You can imagine this is literally going to be zero or one or two or three or four, or it'll keep on changing for every single element in your, um, in your list, right? So for each one, it's actually going to dynamically change my scale to be whatever the index is. So the very first one would be at an index of zero. So we should expect a scale of zero. Hence why if this one was the first one, it probably disappears completely because it would have a zero scale. Next, we'd have an index of one. So we'd expect this guy to look actually just like this. Next, we'd have an index of two. So this guy should be double the size. So let's hook that back up and see if that was correct. We are correct. And we can't really see behind here. Okay, we can. Let me just turn my view. Um, so I was right, like zero, um, one, right? This is scale of one. Now this is double size, uh, triple the size, keeps going bigger, right? So if you can see where I'm going with this, something like this could be actually quite powerful. Um, we just so happen to use scale for this scenario. Uh, and if you like to do kind of a cool growing effect, then, you know, use it for that. But at the end of the day, we have so many different um, geometry nodes we can do this. We can just manipulate things and massage things to be infinitely complex to make like literally anything we want and on the simplest level like what if you didn't what if you thought this was a big obnoxious like hey i like that growing effect but like whoa like obviously this is too much well if you recall we have what's called uh vector math nodes so let's just toss a vector math node go down the wrong one there there we go um, by the way if you hold alt or option uh while clicking you can just take it away without having to like reconnect the line below it so it just like pops off which is super convenient um so we'll do that and in this case, we probably do like, a, I mean, you can do whatever you want. Let's do a multiply. And now we can actually like fine tunely adjust the scale of each one, right? Because what's going on here is we have zero, one, two, three, four, five. We're going to pass that into the scale. So it's actually going to divide by almost 10 here or multiply by 0 0.1, 0 0.12, um, same thing. Point, point one. There we go. Um, and then, then pass it into a scale, right? So you can start to see what kind of possibilities you have here. And as you get more complex, you can get into some really crazy uh, vector math that may or may not be useful. Also, of course, we were scaling everything together. You could scale just certain dimensions if you wanted to, right? So we could just make one, just the X scale, or get bigger as we scale. Um, which one would look the best? You can actually do some pretty wild stuff with this maybe take everything down and then like do something crazy. Anyways, from a stitching perspective, this is, <laughs> I mean, to me, this is not what we want. I mean, it, maybe you have some crazy stitches in your life, but for me, I'm gonna get rid of this. But just to demonstrate the, these, what you would call an attribute and feel free to experiment with these, right? There's, there's a bunch of different options like, you know, scene time, what is scene time? Well, scene time, exactly like it sounds, uh, depending on where you are in your animation. So let's change this to our, where are we? Let's go to our dope sheet, right? So if you've done any animation before, you can scroll through the timeline. This will actually straight up output the frame number you're on or uh, how many seconds you are into your clip. And I mean, the sky's the limit, use your creativity here. But the first thing that comes to my mind, maybe this isn't so creative is, well, what if we actually took the output of something like seconds and literally created a text node on the screen, right? We've already done uh, meshes, we've done curves. It, what about text? So if I go text here, we can do, looks like we can maybe do string to curves. All right, so we can have the ability to pass in all our standard text options. So if I pass our seconds into string, okay, this red connector means it's not happy with that. Why? I think the reason is because this is expecting a string. And again, if you come from a programming background, you'll know that a string is just talking about uh, text, right? That's essentially what a string is. Whereas this output of here is not 
a text output is just like a value. It's like a number value. So uh, if you don't come from that programming background, uh, it's important to know that every single one of these inputs and outputs uh, can have a different data type, right? Um, if I pull up my sidebar here, uh, we're going to talk about inputs and outputs in just a little bit. But just to quickly show you, you know, you got geometry as one of your types, but you can also have strings or uh, integers or floats, uh, which is like a if, if you're not feeling with floats, it'd be, it'd be like a, a number that can have decimal points in it. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a second here, but um, let's go ahead and figure out how to convert this value to something that can go into here. Uh, turns out there's lots of awesome converting functions in geometry nodes. Um, pretty sure there's one here called value to string. Perfect. So we're taking this value and then we're going to output a string. So basically just converting that to from a number to a string. And then we don't see anything because we haven't outputted our curve yet. But if I do that, we'll temporarily get rid of our other stuff. But yeah, boom, look at that, zero. And it's zero because we were zero on the timeline. As I increase this, the number will actually change as we go. So like, I don't know about you, but this is like super exciting to me. This is like in my mind, extremely powerful. Like the, the kind of options you have with this, right? And like I can adjust the decimal point here. So maybe you had like a cool like, you know, timer that counts up as your <laughs> scene goes. I don't know what the use case is there, but I'm sure there is one. Like I said at the very beginning, you're basically programming now at this point, right? So you could always like, what if I didn't want it to count up, but I wanted it to count down? Well, if we knew that the scene had um, was a 10 second clip, then this is actually really easy, right? We just use another math node. So we do go math, this time regular math, not vector math. Um, we're going to pass it into, let's say the bottom value. We'll say we know that the clip is 10 seconds long. And then we just subtract the um, current time, 10 minus the current time. And then that should actually start at 10 and then count down, right? So you can like really go nuts with this. And then I don't know if there's actually a way to grab the total time of the, like the programmer in me is like, ah, I don't like hard coding this to 10 because what if later on I change it from 10 seconds to like 20 seconds, then I have to remember to come back here and change it to 20. It'd be nice if there's somewhere to just like pass whatever the time is for my clip directly into here. To be honest, I'm not sure if there's a way to do that. Let's let's poke around. Did a little bit of research there. So I found out there is a way to grab this value, although not as easy as I hoped it would be. I don't think, I at least I couldn't find any kind of like attribute or way to pull um, something like the total time in the scene within an input or anything. Um, but turns out you can use drivers to do this. And full disclaimer right now, I'm not an expert in drivers, but what you could do is there is a input type called value, which is literally super basic, um, almost has no purpose, right? You just pass in some sort of value and like, great, what, what does that even do? Like, I'm just... <laughs> I'm just doing the same thing, just making it more complicated by using a whole other node, right? Uh, but it turns out that you can actually add a driver to it. And like I said, I'm not an expert on drivers here, um, but basically drivers can be a very powerful tool to script some basic things and have one input driven by a different input, right? So in this case, um, what I would do is I come down here to these input values and I would set this to just a single property uh, and just bear with me here. So first you need to choose which, I guess, ID type here, as this is indicating uh, to pull from. So first, right now we need to ask ourselves, where would I find the total time in a scene? And someone can please correct me if there is a better way to do this, but I didn't find an actual property available for the total time in a clip, but there is uh, the total number of frames in a clip. And then there's also the frame rate in the scene, right? So if we can, if we know the total number of frames and we also know the, um, the frame rate, then theoretically we can basically calculate the time in the clip, right? So how do I get access to this and how do I get access to this, right? Uh, well, thankfully for something like end time, you can just right click and say copy data path and that will actually copy like the underlying Python um, property name. So if you were to actually be doing real scripting, this is how you would easily access um, this property and reference that in your code, right? So what we can do is come here, go to uh, edit driver and um, <clears throat> the expression can just be our var, which is this guy. We need to reference our scene because that's where this property is attached to. And then we need to um, pick a property, or 
sorry, we need to <laughs> choose which scene and now we need to pick which path with the, within that scene. So I can paste what's in my clipboard frame and that should theoretically create a driver that just pulls whatever this value is and pops it into here. And as we can see, boom, driver value is 250. So you can tell it's a driver because it's purple now. Um, let me zoom in for you guys. If I try to change this, it won't do anything because um, it's now locked to this. If I were to go change this value, you can see on the left now that is dynamically changing, which is perfect. That's actually really incredible. So we can go ahead and rename this guy uh, F2, I guess we'll do that. And let's call this um, total frames. Now this isn't 100% true, this is actually the end frame. So if your start frame uh, was higher up and then your end frame was still 250, technically we should be subtracting the end from the start, but whatever, I'm not gonna go that far into this. Uh, especially because this has nothing to do with uh, stitching anymore, but we're, we're going down a rabbit hole here. All right, so now we have the total frames. Let's duplicate that. Uh, and we're going to have another one to grab the FPS. And annoyingly, I wasn't able to right click on this FPS to grab its data value, so I had to look it up. But it, it, do, it is there, it does exist. So we just have to go add driver again. I don't know why, why it likes to add that by default, but uh, we'll come back here and do the same old thing. Reference our scene, scene. And I'll just tell you, and there's documentation to look all these up anyways, but you would do, um, so right now we're on the scene, so you can go scene.render. Uh, FPS, I believe it is. And that grabs the 24 FPS. I wonder if that would have been available under my render settings. Not sure, oh well. Okay, so we got our total frames, we got our FPS. Let's do a little bit of math and we will divide our total frames by our FPS and that should give us our total time in the clip. And apparently it was 10.42 because we're at the very beginning here and it has 10.42, but we can prove that this is correct by going all the way to the very end and we should end at zero at the very end there. Perfect. Uh, although note, if you go past that, we're gonna go negative. So, I mean, theoretically your, your animation should never go past that last frame, but if you're really concerned about that, I'm sure there's some way we could actually cap that. So typically, uh, if you've done any kind of program before, you would cap things by using a math.minimum or math.maximum. So in this case, we want to cap the zero. We don't want to go below zero. So we can just say, choose the maximum between uh, whatever value we have and zero. So if it goes negative, suddenly it now chooses this bottom one as the maximum because uh, it's greater than the negative, right? So now if we go past that, I am lying to your face. Why is that going negative? Oh, <laughs> because I'm an idiot. Uh, I, sh I shouldn't be adding the math.max there. <laughs> this is just passing in our um, total possible time, right? Our actual time is here. We do the subtraction and then here is where we should be doing that capping. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Now you can see anywhere we go past there would be zero. Anyways, total rabbit hole right there. You might not even care about capping in this scenario, but probably useful to know that that is an option for other things where perhaps that'd be a lot more useful. And then since we've gone this far, let's just see this through real quick. Right now, we are just we just got curves rendered, so most likely you want this to be an actual good looking mesh. Um, just like we did before, we can do a good old curve to mesh. And this is actually not what we want. <laughs> I'll take that back because curve to mesh does like a lathe style thing, right? Like a bevel. Um, so just like we did before with our stitching, right? We could add a curve primitive. We could add like a circle curve. Pop that guy on there. Obviously he's gonna scale it down. And yeah, it's creating geometry, but it's like beveling it, right? Uh, I mean, maybe this is what you're going for. It actually looks kind of cool. But what I was actually intending is a, to like extrude this thing, right? So under text, no, not under text, under curve, there is actually a thing called fill curve, and this is what we're looking for. Now this has actually added a face to our curve, which we can do something with. So if you recall, now that we're a mesh, we can go down to the mesh, and there's a good old extrude mesh. Sweet, we're extruding. It's a little obnoxious, let's bring that down. And you get the idea here, right? So back to what we talked about at the very beginning, you just keep going, right? And like the best part is, is every single node I'm adding to the scene here is an action that I would have been doing in regular old Blender, right? Okay, first I create my curve and then I fill it, right? I'm extruding it. Like, yeah, it's a, it's more modular. And we have um, have to do maybe a little bit more work sometimes, but in my opinion, that's a really good thing. And so like a common scenario here is you're like, oh, well, normally I would like right click on this guy and say shade smooth, but naturally that doesn't work because again, we're just on this curve. We're not actually smooth shading 
our mesh anymore. Like we can't consider anything in in this viewport here as as something we can work with. It's all got to be within our geometry nodes. So then the first thing that we think of is like, hmm, is there like an actual shade smooth node? Hey, would you look at that? Set shade smooth. So if we pass that guy in, we're actually ha have the option to enable or disable shade smoothing. Now that looks kind of nuts. And the reason, one of the big reasons is because when we filled our curve, uh, it decided to use triangles to do that. And in general, in Blender, you want to use uh, N-Gons. That looks quite a bit better. Still quite funky here. And um, if you've had this scenario before, you might be familiar with the fact that you might come into this uh, normals and do this auto smoothing. Um, I'm just choosing our old cylinder for now. Remember, we did that at the very beginning. Um, right, this guy, we came in and we said um, auto smooth. Otherwise, it would have done that weird kind of curve thing. So if we go back to this guy. Again, I'm hitting slash on my keyboard and then you can hit dot on your numpad to zoom in. We want to basically add that auto smooth, which basically says anything built beyond this angle, I want you to, to automatically smooth, right? But beyond that, don't, and that way we can keep that crisp edge. So how do we do that? Um, is there a node to basically do that smoothing? And this is a good time to talk about something you might see commonly in geometry nodes and it's called a selection. So in this case, we have set shade smooth, say that 10 times fast, please. And it asks for like one option to pass into this is this selection. And you might've seen that before. I think, you know, this instance on points, it actually had a selection as well. What is selection talking about? So selection, you, you can think of as choosing the vertices within that mesh um, you're basically filtering that down for this operation, right? So in this case, instead of adding a shade smooth to the entire mesh, what if we could filter that down to only be certain vertices within that mesh to apply that shade smoothing to, which is essentially what's happening down here with this auto smooth normal. This is a lot simpler and easier to work with. And here we're, we're kind of getting more under the hood. We got to do it ourselves, but this selection is how we basically, um, do that filtering. So turns out there is a node called uh, normal and this is an attribute like we talked about before so again attributes are within the node that you're working with um, can grab certain values out of there right so if before we had index and that would be zero one two three four or whatever depending on the current point that we did that back there um, we can do one called normal um, except that's not enough what we need to do is we need to combine this with a math operation so let's go math pass in there and let's say instead of actually performing math we can do within this math node we can do what's called um, a comparison and so we can say as long as the normal is less than a certain value then provide the shade smoothing that's the selection again we're filtering right so now I can actually adjust this threshold in the less than I'm gonna hold shift to really make the sensitivity go down because it's really sensitive, right? So like I'm in the like the 0.2 range. So if I have zero, right, there's no shade smoothing whatsoever. Um, actually, there is, interestingly enough, I got to go into the negatives. But as I slowly creep that up, you can see where we're getting that shade smoothing to happen there, kind of. And why is this number so low? Well, the reason for that is because we're working in radians right now. So if you recall with angles, you can have degrees or radians. Radians are like if you recall from your math class, what is it? Math dot pi divided by two is equal to 90 degrees. So uh, radians are gonna be different. So we can work in radians or again, we're, we have nodes and we're fully flexible here. So why not just work in degrees? Cause that's easier here. So it turns out there's another math node called, or math uh, operation, let's say, called two radians. So there's two degrees and two radians. In this case, we need radians at the end of the day. So we can start with our degrees, uh, let's say 30 degrees. Okay, that wasn't right, but start with degrees, uh, pass it into here, and that will actually convert that to radians. Like how convenient, right? So we'll take that down. And I guess it was around there that we wanted the, um, the normals to be. Um, why are we only getting part of it? Okay, just a little bit of digging there again. Um, uh, I remember I made this mistake last time. It's not normals that we want for the attribute here because um, that always trips me up because it's called, uh, it's under the normal tab here. So I just think that's what I need to work with here. Instead, there's actually a property called um, edge angle um, and that must be an input, right? 
no, that's actually coming from a mesh, right? Because only a mesh would have an edge angle. So um, down here we have edge angle, and that's actually what we care about here, not the normal. So let's put the angle into there. And then now as we tweak this, whoa, we're very close, but still getting kind of a funny situation. And I finally figured this one out too. Um, turns out when we extruded our mesh, we had this setting called individual turned on. We turn that off, boom, instantly those go away. And then we can pull this back down to a number that we would have expected, like 30. Um, hence the default, right? You always see this at 30 as the default because that's like 99% of the time what you want. Um, so I was actually a bit surprised that this wasn't 30. Um, so if I just change it to 30 now, boom, it now works with that setting. So what is this individual? What does that actually do? Well, I did a quick Google. Um, by the way, if you ever want more information on what these mean, check out the Blender documentation. But yeah, so individual, if you come down to individual, whether to extrude each face individually rather than extruding connected groups of faces together as region. A quad side face will be generated on each side of every selected face. So it's a bit cryptic, but I think the general gist is uh, you might be getting extra faces or extra, extra geometry that you didn't expect because it's treating multiple faces uh, in their own individually rather than in groups. So in our case, we wanted it to treat it as a group and that's what we would have expected. Okay, the last thing you might have noticed as I've been moving the viewport around that we have no bottom face. Why is that? Uh, well, it turns out for greatest flexibility, I guess, the extrude mesh literally doesn't always behave as you might expect. It will actually just extrude in one direction and you don't get a face on the other side. And I'm not bashing the Blender developers here at all. That wasn't supposed to be passive aggressive. Uh, I, truly, there must have been a good reason for this. Um, this must provide the most, like, the most flexibility uh, in the design. Uh, again, it just means we need to do a little bit more work. So if we, before we fill our curve, or sorry, before we extrude the mesh, but after we fill the curve, turns out there is a node called a, um, Nope. Flip faces. And if you want to know where that is, let me tell you. It's under mesh, flip faces. So what does this do? Well, if we pass this guy into, well, first of all, how about we do this? We'll, we'll just put it right in between here and see what happens. So the second that I quote unquote flip the faces here, you can see what's happened. It's actually uh, gone the opposite way. It, it started here and gone down. So now we have a, a face on the bottom, but now we don't have a face on the top. So we're just kind of like <laughs> have the same problem just in the other direction. Um, but you can see what it's doing here. I think it's kind of flipping the face, the normal of the face uh, to face, uh, to invert it, right? So what if we just, uh, instead of flipping the faces there, what if we just actually flip the face here? So basically we're adding another face on the other side and then we can't pass into here, right? You can only have one mesh input. We'll just have the same effect. Um, but what we can do is we can merge. Basically we have two meshes now. We have this extruded mesh and then we have this other face flipped on the bottom as it should be just sitting here, not extruded. Uh, and then if we can just combine these two together somehow, everything should look correct. Uh, so to combine meshes, we can go into, no, it's not dual mesh. Um, combine, I know it's in here somewhere. Here we go, join geometry. Um, so if I pass that here, uh, this is an interesting data type, by the way, right? Um, this input here, it's got like this big kind of circle. Uh, I guess it's not a circle. Um, looks like multiple circles right beside each other and that's because this actually can accept multiple geometries which is cool um so now if i pass that guy in there as well just like we hope for now this flipped bottom face is basically getting merged with our extruded mesh and we have basically what we would have expected normally for an extrusion operation amazing so now we can you know we got our our countdown timer cool so again <laughs> this had nothing to do with our original stitching, but hopefully you guys learned a lot about more options you have with geometry nodes um, to do something like this countdown timer. Uh, okay, before I completely just disregard and remove this countdown timer, let me show you uh, this concept called grouping. And this is actually pretty huge, and let me explain why. So grouping is more than just me hitting like, uh, is it Command G, right click, or not right click, you go Shift A, make group. So yeah, it was Command G. Yes, that will group everything together into its own thing. But now that group can be reusable anywhere else in your geometry nodes. And that is the power of groups. Uh, and in addition to that, you can explicitly set the inputs and the outputs of that group. And 
as a programmer, that is pretty freaking cool. So uh, let's go make group. Yeah, so we haven't talked about uh, group inputs and group outputs yet. Um, you noticed back when we were uh, over here, by the way, I'm hitting tab to go into this, right? Now we can bring all this over because that was just obnoxiously big, now small. So if you wanna go into a group, you hit tab. It's like, ed think edit mode, you know, ta you're tabbing into it. So here we had this geometry, right? But as you can see, there's this empty group slot here. And what I can actually do with this is pass this into anything here and that actually becomes a new input for the group. And I'll do that here on this level, but first let me go back into my timer, um, which by the way, you should always be naming these something meaningful. So F2 to rename, uh, let's call this like countdown timer. And that's what I've named this node, but the actual node group should be called that. Right, so I just created another instance of it now. Um, this is just like the name of this instance of the group, whereas this is the name of the actual group. So this th this one down here is actually more important, but I would do both. And now that I've renamed that to countdown timer, um, if I come over here, you can see I have now two geometry nodes. One is our original geometry nodes that I never renamed for my stitching. Let's call that stitching. <laughs> By the way, always name your stuff like you'll thank yourself later so stitching and then we have another one called countdown timer so at the end of the day this subgroup that i created is actually it's on the same level as my stitching group right and if you start to think about geometry node groups in this way you can start to see the power behind it right because i can now just take this countdown timer and apply it to any old thing i can create a good old um uh empty like something that doesn't have any uh, geometry whatsoever <laughs> That's funny. Empties actually don't have modifiers. <laughs> Never mind. I'm going to add a, uh, I don't know, let's just do like a cube. So I'll come to modifiers. I'll go into geometry nodes and I could pick, oh, I just created a new one. I actually don't want that. I want to pick uh, my countdown timer and I think they're overlapping. But look, like now I can just immediately apply that countdown timer to another node or like we're doing in our uh, curve, you can actually add it as a sub group within this. And you can just keep going. I can go tab into this guy, have another group and pass that into here. I could create my stitching group and put it into here. Now that's going to be crazy. Um, actually, what's going to happen? Because that would be like, wouldn't that be like an infinite loop? I'm kind of afraid to do that. I should save my file first. <laughs> Okay, this is hilarious uh, in the best way possible. So uh, Blender team has actually predicted someone trying to do this before. So they've, they're purposely filtering out. Um, when you go control or shift A group, um, you can go ahead and uh, it'll show all the groups available to put in here as like a quote unquote subgroup. And uh, yeah, they, they purposely filter out all the, the groups that would turn this into some infinite recursion, infinite loop scenario. Um, right, because if I, I can't put another countdown timer in this countdown timer because it, it would just go into infinity, right? <laughs> uh, my nested countdown timer is also gonna have another nested and it would just keep going. Uh, same thing would apply if I put, uh, were to try to put a stitching one in here because stitching contains countdown timer. So that would just also result in an infinite loop or infinite recursion rather. And um, and yeah, <laughs> that, uh, Blender actually has accounted for that and purposely filters out groups that would cause that to happen, which is smart. Um, even though I like quote unquote deleted that geometry node one, you can see it has a zero here. It just, I can still access it, but it's technically deleted. I got to hit the X again. And if I were to save my file and close and open it back up, it, it would remove. Um, I've always found this kind of confusing at first. Um, there's probably a good reason for this. Uh, but if you really want to get rid of it, you just go to your blender file node groups. These are all my, um, material nodes. So your material nodes and your geometry nodes get just bundled together into this node group type. Come here and just go delete because, and that would permanently delete it. All right, let's rewind. Where were we? Oh, whoops, we actually deleted our geometry nodes by accident. <sighs> Stitching, we're back. And of course, in that process, I just created another one. Sorry, guys, delete. Okay, so we've exhausted the idea of groups. Hopefully you understand that. And, but we haven't talked about inputs and outputs. So uh, right now this stitching group is working because we, we're passing to the output of this node. If I take that away, that goes away, right? So uh, from a, think from a programming perspective or just from any kind of modularity perspective, this is amazing. Each group has its own input and output. If you go back to this level, there's the output. If I had an input, it would have been on this side. You're basically creating your own nodes at the end of the day, which is pretty epic. So like I've created my own custom node called countdown timer just now. So this is actually a good time to talk about inputs as well. 
like in this scenario, what would be a possible input that maybe this countdown timer would want? I mean, potentially like start time, um, although we, we've done a bunch of work to make this smart by um, auto trying to calculate your total frames or your your, your total duration. Maybe we make that customizable, right? Like like you are you are the node developer now, right? <laughs> so really right now you can decide, like maybe you have a, an option that says custom length or, or just pull from the scene. And you do some fancy math logic that says if they chose to do a custom time, then pass that into into the subtract function. Otherwise, just use this uh, pre-calculated thing, which by the way, we could just take this, group that, command G, call this scene duration. And now we have a reusable new node called scene duration that we can use anywhere. So you don't have to be duplicating these node setups over and over again. Um, I would highly encourage you guys to like, even in like a very micro modular situation, like even on a couple nodes at a, at a time, turn those into groups, why not? And um, now it's not such a mess, right? One of the worst things with the node editor is just how crazy things can get. So modularize, modular, bleh, modularize things, that was hard to say, um, as you go. And not only does your whole graph look a lot simpler, now you can actually reuse those little pieces that you create along the way um, over and over again, perhaps, right? If I ever need the scene duration, I can use that again. So like, okay, let's just quickly entertain this thought. What if I want to give the, the you know, the Blender artist, whoever's going to use this node, in this case, me for now, but what if I share this, right? What if I want to give them the option to like have like a checkbox on here that says like, um, use custom time otherwise it will use um the the scene duration right so how would i do that um a couple options so number one where would i manage these inputs and outputs if i wanted to and the way you'd access that is in this sidebar here see that little arrow um the shortcut for this is n if you're familiar with that right that pulls up that sidebar there so if i go n uh and then make sure you're clicking on group up here, you can do things like rename. So let's call this, uh, uh, whatever, we can call it group input, that's fine. Um, you can like colorize these things if you really want to. Sky's a limit, kind of cool. Uh, anyways, so we go down to group and we could add an input here. And what's like a checkbox? How do you do like yes or no? Well, in program, we call that a Boolean. Boolean is like one or zero, yes or no, um, true or false. We can give it a default value. Uh, what do we have the default value to? We'll come back to that in a second here. Uh, what do we want to call this? We can call this um, custom duration. And then we can actually do a little bit of what you do. In, it's called Boolean logic, also known as like a simple if statement. So again, if you're a programmer or you have even like, you know, read one line of code in your life, you might've seen like, oh, if an if statement, if this situation, then do this, otherwise do this. Um, turns out we can do that within geometry nodes. Uh, like I said, we're literally programming right now. So to do that, you do what's called Boolean math. Uh, and you can do an operation, right? Okay, so it turns out that's actually not what we really wanted here. In this scenario, we don't actually want the Boolean logic at this point in time. What we should have actually added was what's called a switch and basically treat a switch as like an if statement. If this, do this, otherwise do this. And this is like so amazing that this node exists within geometry nodes. Where is switch? Good question. It's under utilities there. So same spot as math and some of the these other useful things we got uh, switch. All right, so how does switch work? So first you need to talk about the type, right? Cause you're, you're, we're switching between two different things, right? In our case, we wanna say if they checked off that they want a custom duration, and then I just now added this second input for the duration itself, this would be a uh, float. Like I said, float is a number that can have a decimal. So basically, if they choose yes to custom duration, then we're gonna allow, then we want them to use this duration. Otherwise, if they unchecked this, then they should just use our default scene duration. And actually we want this, I think we should have this unchecked by default. By default, just use the scene duration. Um, and then if they really want to, they can use their custom duration, right? So we need to decide what we're switching between. So what are we switching between? What's the type? Well, we're not switching between geometries, right? We're switching between scene durations. And what data type is that? Well, that's a float, like we were just talking about. So if we come into our data types, we'll go to float. And now you can see these two have changed to allow you to have float. So, so what's happening here is basically you're saying, give it a switch. So in this case, um, custom duration, this is that Boolean. There's our switch, right? Ye yay or nay. Um, if they checked yes, then use this value for true. 
and output that. If they checked false, use this value for false and output that. So using the full power of nodes, we can say if custom duration was false, then we'll go ahead and use our scene duration, false scene duration, and we'll output that into our pipeline. And then if it was true, AKA they did want a custom duration, then we can now pass in whatever their custom duration was. So let's see how that's working. Good, it is using our scene duration by default. If we tab out of here, we can see now that our node has these two inputs that we just created, right? These two inputs here, inputs here, that's what these are now. And not only can I, at this point, check what my input's gonna be, I could feed something else into this, right? So it's, it's extremely modular. And it looks like this is actually working, right? Because I say, if I didn't check this, then go ahead and use the scene duration, which it's using. Uh, if I do check this, then use whatever this is. And I can go ahead and change this to 20, let's say, and it will actually pop in the 20 instead. This is perfect. Now, you might be thinking, especially if you're a programmer, uh, ideally, I don't even want to show this duration if this custom duration is uh, unchecked, right? Often in these menus, right? Once you check something, more options appear below, but like why even show them, you know, if they're not relevant? So is there a way to like conditionally show an input, like only show this duration if this custom duration it was checked? And to be honest, I do not think there's a way to do that. I think we're asking too much at this point. <laughs> in my opinion, it's actually pretty amazing that we can even get to this point, but maybe in the future, Blender will add an option that's like, oh, okay, so hide. I was wondering what this hide value did. Um, um, all it's doing is preventing you from at from like entering the value right here. You have to pass something into it, um, which I don't think is necessary. It's kind of pointless for us. So now you can at least set it here if you want to, or you can still continue to pass something in from that side. So yeah, anyways, I don't think there's a way to say like only show this input if this guy was checked. That would be sweet, but someday. So that's inputs. Um, just like inputs, we can have outputs. 99% uh, of the time, you're just going to have this geometry output because within geometry nodes, we're trying to produce geometry, but it doesn't have to be, right? This could actually be just like the inputs. This could be any other data type. I could take something else that I've you know created along the way. Maybe I thought this, um, I don't know, maybe I thought the text coming out of our, our whole duration formula would have been handy for something. So I probably wouldn't do the string. If, if I thought this was gonna be handy, the string's not gonna be that useful. I would probably prefer just to use the, the value itself. So I could grab that value, come all the way over here and pass that as, as an output. Um, please rename this because value is pretty meaningless. Call this um, at least something like text value. Uh, that's gonna be float. And now if I come back here, we can see that in addition to these two inputs in our geometry output, we now have another output called text value. You know, maybe this is useful for some reason. Like we have the geometry of our countdown timer, but maybe I want the actual float value of that timer to be fed into something else that could be useful for something, right? You never, you know, the possibilities are endless. So uh, nothing stops you from having multiple outputs as well. So I'm pretty happy with this countdown timer. Um, I don't think we're ever gonna use this again <laughs> in this project because once again, we're, we're trying to do stitching. This was a massive rabbit hole, but hopefully a good rabbit hole for learning. Um, so I'm gonna just delete this node, this group rather. Um, don't be afraid to do that. Like I talked about before, they are saved here in your geometry nodes. So we have our countdown timer that we can always come back to. Um, if you were worried, you could check this fake user thing, which basically tells Blender to never garbage collect this thing. Um, what's a user, like what's a fake user? Uh, a user for Blender is talking about, uh, is there something else in my Blender document that's referencing this object? <laughs> okay, what, is, what does that mean? Um, the way Blender works is like almost everything, right? Like your nodes, um, also your um, objects here, like anything in your Blender file, any, any of these things. Um, is like a reference within the project, right? It, it's like, it's an object within your within your project, um, but other things can reference that. Um, that's why you can do things like linking um, multiple meshes to the same, like multiple objects to the underlying mesh rather, if you've ever done that before, right? If I create two cubes, right now they're just completely two separate cubes, right? I got my good old measurement here, get rid of that. Okay, so I got two, uh, I got two cubes. They're completely separate cubes. If I change one, did not apply to the other one. And that's just because you can see we got one, two cubes. If you look at their underlying mesh, we got two separate ones. We got cube zero, zero, one and cube two. Um, and I'll be really quick with this rabbit hole. These are decoupled, right? 
we have this underlying mesh, but then we have the object reference in it. And then we have this other uh, underlying mesh and this one reference in it. But there's nothing that stops me from using like this underlying mesh on both of these cubes. So that's why you could do something like, um, instead of shift D to duplicate, you could do alt D or option D. It will also duplicate it. Uh, however, it duplicated it linked, right? If you go object, duplicate, there's duplicate, which is shifty, but then duplicate linked. What does linked mean? Well, you're actually uh, pulling in that underlying mesh and they're actually, it's referencing the same mesh under the hood. So now if I come into here and modify one of them, boom, it's actually modifying both of them because they both reference the underlying mesh. However, this guy, the object itself has its own transform properties, right? I can scale this guy up and down and that is in fact independent from the other guy. And But that's because this, is different from this, but the underlying mesh that they're referencing is the same. So as I continue to modify it, they'll still be modified. These are just transformations on top of that, right? So it's really like once you kind of start to understand this is how Blender works, everything becomes like way more clear how you can actually like use it to your advantage. I'll admit it took me a very long time to understand this is how Blender works. I, I just thought it was very confusing, unnecessarily complicated. But once you start thinking about it like that, then that changes things, right? So this cube 001 is in fact a single instance within our um, Blender file, but it can be referenced in multiple places, right? Um, if I go back to our Blender file, to our uh, da, 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 meshes, here is that cube mesh that we were referring to, right? Um, and then here is the actual object that was referencing that. So they're two separate things. And so <laughs> let's reel it in. What Blender does sometimes is if there's nobody referencing something anymore, then Blender will do what's called garbage collecting, which means it says, oh, this, this thing's not used anymore, um, especially if they decided to delete it, in which case you would see like that zero next to it, right? Um, let's create a new one. There is, if I hit this X, it didn't actually remove it, but it has this zero next to it. That's because if I go into the nodes here, it still exists but it's marked for deletion because nothing's referencing it. As soon as something references it, then it will continue to keep it in the scene. So what this F does, if you've seen this F or this fake user, what does that mean? It just means like pretend there's something referencing it uh, in Blender. It, once something references another instance of something, that's called a user. It's a, it's a user of this node. So to create a fake user is basically saying, hey, like I know there's nothing referencing this right now, but just pretend like there is so that you don't garbage collect the thing and get rid of it, right? So that may be something you want to do here. Let me just get rid of this because I'm OCD and I don't even like to see it in here. I want to go on. Okay, so we've we've exhausted that discussion. Let us, oh, we can't tab out of this because we're actually, we actually changed, we added this uh, geometry node to this mesh over here. That's actually kind of hilarious. Let's delete those guys. Uh, we'll come back here. Now I can still not tab out because I changed the type. Let's take it back to stitching. Right, I had deleted that, right? So that's why I wasn't tabbing in or out anymore. Okay, so we talked about inputs and outputs. Does my stitching need any kind of inputs? Can you think of any kind of inputs that would be useful for stitching? Well, I can. I can think of a number actually right now. For example, you are now a geometry node developer. I mean, in a sense, you've almost made like an add-on called like stitching. You can now share this out on with somebody else and be like, hey, like you want a stitching? I got gotcha. you. Here's a stitching node. So we better provide that person who's going to use this node, whether it's us or somebody else, some useful inputs to change things so that they don't have to dig into this and like understand how this works and be like, okay, like I want this thing to maybe scale in a certain direction or scale as a certain size. Like, you know, they don't know what they're doing. Let's make it really easy for them. So what's something that we may want to allow them to adjust? Well, I think the scale perhaps could be one of them. I don't see why not. If we were intense, what we could do is like we did before, we could like cap it out. So maybe like cap it out in a certain situation where it couldn't grow bigger than the stitch size, but maybe not. Maybe you want to give them the option to like do something nuts like that. So I'll leave that capping as an exercise for you. For us, for now, what we're gonna do is add this as an input. And last time I added inputs by coming into here and manually going plus and blah, blah, blah. You can still do that. A much easier way is actually just to do a reverse connection. So I take the scale, pass it into here, and then instantly it's out of this input for me. Often this name is not gonna be what you want. It's just gonna inherit the name of the property that you connected for convenience. In this case, scale actually does make sense, but maybe we can call this like stitch scale. I don't know. Maybe that's redundant. I'm gonna call it stitch scale for now. But like, how, how can I use that now, right? I'm on the top level of my um, geometry node. So where can I actually access this? Well, if you recall, 
Geometry tree nodes actually at the end of the day are just modifiers. So if you come back to your modifier tab, this stitching group, which by the way, here you can also change it to all these other ones. Suddenly I now have this stitch scale, which allows me to change the scale here, which is perfect. If I were to like temporarily, get, if I get rid of that here, you can see now that input is gone. Um, so that's, that's what's going on here. And I actually really like the fact that we're changing this scale before we turn it into a mesh because if you kind of noticed as I'm scaling this, it's scaling the curve, but you can notice like the, the mesh itself isn't really scaling. Like it's not getting thicker or anything as I scale. And um, that's actually like a happy accident in this situation. Going full on Bob Ross here. Um, if I had this transform after my mesh, right? Transform, put it here. Then it would in fact scale the radius and everything which to me is not what we want. Like if we're giving them the option to scale the stitch, I think we want to actually allow them to scale that in isolation. I do think it would be useful for them to change the radius though, but just as a separate value. Turns out we have this radius here, which we had built in. So let's go ahead and provide that guy as an input. Instantly now they can change the radius, which is amazing. And I guess to be consistent, let's call this stitch radius. Again, I might regret this. I might just get rid of this word stitch on everything because maybe that's obvious, but that's pretty sweet. What else might the person want to adjust? Well, we had set this length to something arbitrary, like, and if you recall, this is a length between stitches. I don't know. I think this is something someone might want to adjust. So let's go ahead and pop that in here. In this case, I think length is definitely a bad name. Let's call this um, spacing. And you know what? Screw it. I'm going to get rid of the word stitch. It's bothering me now. This whole, this whole node is called stitching, so it should be obvious that scale means the scale of the stitch. If you had multiple different types of scale, that's when maybe you'd want to be more specific with your naming, right? Cool. So we can adjust that. We can adjust that. And we can adjust that. Super cool. Now, let us talk about materials because this definitely tripped me up. You're all happy with your stitches. You are... Let's... Bring it back into this scene. What has happened here? Oh, <laughs> we, got, we got our old school stitch, which is having a tough time right now. Okay, I actually brought that in earlier. I should have just kept it out here. All right, so let's actually build our, our real stitch now. So if you recall, this was our leather patch that we're stitching to something. There we go. Um, now the stitch feels like pretty tiny unless this is like a massive leather patch. <laughs> so let's actually use our handy dandy inputs now to um, maybe let's start with our spacing. Space them a little bit more, maybe make them just a little thicker. Scale can come up, right? This is already becoming very useful. I guess another thing that might be nice as an input now that I'm looking at it is like whoever stitched this <laughs> uh, didn't do a good job, right? This is actually not a great stitching because you want this tight and this looks kind of like someone just did a haphazard loose stitch. So how would we change maybe the height of this curve? Well, if we come in back to here, what we did at the very beginning, if you recall, we have this Y value. And because we made our life easy by, you know, forcing our certain end to have even handles, it's actually really, really easy now. And this is actually pretty much required now that we want to make this an input, right? We want to take this Y value and allow them to adjust that Y value and call it like, I don't know, stitch tightness or something. And so that works perfectly. Now, how can I grab this Y value? As you can see, there's no, there's no Y input here. And to do that, we can actually replace our vector node with a different one called a XYZ. So you can, we can separate XYZ or we can combine XYZ. In this case, since we want our Y to be an input, we do a combine, right? So it's, it's basically the same thing as here, except now you can have inputs to each one of these, which is perfect. So let's go 1.420. And then that guy was just zero. So now we can basically replace this with this guy. I'm just gonna do this manually. I messed up here. There we go, negative one. Um, and we can get rid of that guy. And now this will still behave exactly like we had before, but now we can have inputs. So I can take this Y, pass it into here. Please rename it. We're gonna call this um, tightness or looseness, whichever you prefer. Um, the higher the value, the more loose it is. So maybe we should actually call this looseness. Either one works, I think. But now we have the ability to kind of adjust that and give the end user, the end artist, the ability to adjust the looseness of their stitch. By the way, there's default values for all of these, right? So if I were to create a brand new stitching node um, on something else, it, it's not gonna have these values, it's gonna have a bunch of default values. What are those default values? You can find those in here. Um, so like looseness has a default value of 1.1 and why, like, why did it choose 1.1? Well, that's actually what I had here before. If you recall, I had 1.1. So 
the way inputs work is whatever you ha you know start this on before you come in here and connect it it'll just for convenience make that value be your default but you can change it later too so let's just change that back to what we had before looseness 1.1 was a looseness do we like that let's, that's pretty loose i'm going to say that's not what we want our default to be let's make like that our default so like 0.25 yeah 0.3 maybe 0.3 so i can just copy that into here and that just means so the next time i try to use this geometry node as a whole it's going to have that as my default so i think that's good and then probably best practice would be for me to come back through all these other ones and give them like a sane default that you think most people would want again they can always change it though okay yet another tangent let's get back to our materials so You've got your stitch on your leather patch. You're pretty stoked about this. You you want to give this a material. So what do you do in this situation? Well, you just head on over to the shading tab, of course. Um, you add a new material and you're like, oh yeah, defaulted to white, no big deal. Let's just change that to, you know, I want it to be like a brown color. Let's make it a bit darker. You kind of tweak this, you're getting, you're feeling good about it. Um, actually, funny enough, we actually created a stitch already uh, earlier for our other guy, except it's not working. What's going on? Is it something weird with this uh, viewport shading? What if I go to my actual render view? Still no luck. Um, what is going on? And then you realize, oh, right. I'm working with geometry nodes. Once again, according to Blender's perspective, this is just a simple old circle curve, right? Um, you can't add materials to curves. Uh, you can add materials to meshes, but you can't add them to curves. So dang, even though I'm adding this material to the stitch, like it's letting me do it, uh, it's completely useless. So what are my options here? Well, just like everything else when it comes to geometry nodes, you can actually assign the material within geometry nodes. So you just go add material and you get, there's actually a handy dandy set material, pop that here. So anytime you see like set whatever and you pass it into the pipeline, that just like sets some property on it. So in this case, it's gonna set our material on that guy. Um, we can go ahead and set this to our stitching material and then okay finally we actually have our stitching material coming through there now you're thinking this is kind of inconvenient like it would have been nice to somehow use that um shading node and i was trying to see if there's a way to actually like in the same way we pulled like our scenes duration is there some way to like pull this current elements material from here and then like programmatically in a way pop that into here um, I don't think there's a way yet as of the time I'm making this video. This material selection is just <laughs> the same thing. It's just deferring this to another node. You can do material index, which will not work. But what if we do material, material index? <laughs> Guys, I, I felt like I was so close here. I thought there was a way to like material index. I thought would be um, like each material here has an index zero, one, two, three, four, five or something like that. Uh, so I thought this would just like cycle through those indexes and then I could pass in the current materials index in there. Not working, not sure. Uh, yeah, not sure if there's a way to do this. Someone please let me know if there is a way. That would be pretty freaking awesome. So anyways, for now, we're gonna stick to this. But as a pretty reasonable compromise, what we can do is, again, just add our material as an input, connect that guy there, and then instantly now we have the ability to set the material here. So that's actually not that bad because yeah, it's not in the shading tab or like it's not under the material tab here. Technically this is doing nothing. I might as well get rid of that just to not confuse myself. Um, but I can come here and that is now an input that I can pass in. So that's good. And in a way this kind of makes sense, right? Because what if my geometry nodes was, were so complicated that I had many meshes in my node group here, right? And um, I wanted, you know, each of those meshes to have a different material. Like what if I'm building some fancy geometry node that like creates a, you know, buildings and stuff like that. You might have seen something like that before. A building is not going to have one color, right? You might have a roof that's brown and, you know, the building might have a different color. So uh, in a way, you couldn't just have one material out of there. You need multiple. So it's kind of fair. In that case, whoever would build that modifier uh, or that geometry node would probably have many materials here for each thing like roof color, um, roof material, f front door, et cetera, right? Window. So you know, thinking about it from that perspective, I think that's actually kind of fair. Cool. So we got materials. I think we're getting really close, guys. We've brought out all our inputs that we think could be valuable. We can now set the material. We can do all that. So I think we're nearly done this 
tutorial here today. Next up with our patch, we probably want to add our nice logo here. I'll save that for another video. We will also want to attach this patch to something cool. We'll save that for also another video. Um, I really hope you guys learned something today within geometry nodes. It took a lot of digging and experimenting to figure this stuff out. Uh, I wish I knew this before I started using geometry nodes. And there's so much more beyond what I've discussed today. Um, what I would highly encourage you to do is just experiment, right? Um, kind of like we did today. Just like you got an idea, you're kind of curious about something, uh, poke around with it. And like the more you kind of understand how things can relate and work together and like those core tools like switches are super cool, right? Um, all these different little operations we can do. Now, once you have that foundation, you can kind of like go crazy. And you know, you're you're gonna be continually exploring. I, I doubt you'll ever really understand every single geometry node. And if you do, wow, that's incredible. Good job. But at least hopefully now you have a little bit of that foundation to help give you a bit of a, a kickstart uh, working with geometry nodes. So thanks again, guys. Thanks for joining me today. And I hope to catch you down the next rabbit hole.